Hi, this is Tim of the 1916 Company. Welcome and thanks for logging on. We're waking up with watches and everything is for sale. Reach out to me. I am T Masso at thewatchbox.com for pricing and details. We buy what we sell. We sell what we buy. We are always looking to add inventory. Trade us a watch you're not wearing for one you would love or even trade several watches into one. We can often offer better value on a trade than an outright sale. But if you're seeking to sell outright, we pay cash, we pay fast, no upper limit on value paid, we walk you through the process and make it a no-brainer. Again, no upper limit on value paid. We will buy millions of dollars worth of watches sight unseen with a wire. Reach out to Tmaso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details of anything you see in this show. Let's jump out with a big piece, 43 millimeters. This is Omega's bronze gold Speedmaster chronoscope. Now, when this came out, it was effectively a throwback watch, a vintage-inspired twin register, triple scale dial, and a manual wind caliber. It was, in my opinion, 2021's most interesting chronograph and possibly the most interesting Omega of that model year. Now, this is bronze gold. It's 37.5% gold, but it's also palladium. It's also silver. The secondaries give it a rich hue, corrosion resistance, and greater scratch resistance than conventional 18 karat gold. Because this is a gold case, it has a ceramic tachymeter, not the standard aluminum anodized one on the steel models, so it's richer. It has a dramatically cambered box section sapphire to give it some vintage vibe, and again, to keep it reasonably thin, we have a case back that is display, albeit bereft of a rotor. Now I'm going to throw it on my wrist, 16 centimeters in circumference, so you get a sense of how it wears. It's actually not bad at all. I find that though it's a 43, it wears more like a 41 or a 42, and it is reasonably thin for a modern Speedmaster. And on the wrist, it's got incredible presence. It looks a lot more expensive than it is, especially in this unique bronze gold. So the timepiece is distinctive. And with gold hands and applique gold Arabic numerals, it is also distinguished. Taking a quick look, we'll get a little bit closer now. You can see that the dial features concentric scales, outboard a telemeter, which allows you to gauge distance. Inboard of that, a pulsation scale, which allows you to gauge a pulse rate, a pulse rate per minute. And then inboard of that, it says base 1000, that is a tachymeter, which allows you to gauge speed. Taking a quick look, you can see there's a mono counter at three o'clock with coaxial chronograph hours and minutes, so it looks like a vintage twin register. It is actually a modern triple register. The action, courtesy of a visible case back column wheel, is super crisp. We've got twin barrels and a 60-hour power reserve. It's anti-magnetic, basically to the point of being a-magnetic, and it has a full balance bridge with a full free-sprung balance for shock tolerance. It also uses a vertical clutch, so its engagement is absolutely seamless with no jump or stagger, and I really can't overemphasize how good this column wheel feels. Plus, with the vertical clutch, there's no additional wear and tear, so you can leave the chrono running on a full-time basis. Jump into the back one more time, we have Omega's distinctive blackened screws and spiral arabesque Cote de Genève. We have a nice vintage-inspired strap calfskin with a contrasting binding. And then you can see on the reverse side that while it is an unconventional type of gold, it is nevertheless still hallmarked. That is a very cool watch. So if you like these earth tones on your watch, but you want something even sportier, may I recommend the 2021 500 piece limited edition Blancpain 50 Fathoms Bathyscaphe Day Date Desert Edition in honor of a 1962 Death Valley dive. That's right, a dive in fresh water in the middle of the desert. This watch is a dive watch with desert sand gradient fade dial and a sailcloth strap to match. Historically inspired, you can see it has an outboard grill featuring the numerals with a metallic satin finish, black numerals, and shocks of red. Then we have a metallic sunburst center. We have these freestanding inboard indices. We have hands that are a hybrid of baton and syringe. And then we have a day and a date. There's a gradient fade on champagne at the center to brown bronze at the edge. There is a stop seconds function. And then we have a double quick set function. So you can rapidly reset the calendar should the watch run down or encounter an irregular length month. 
Now, five day power reserve, 120 hours, three main spring barrels, 300 meter water resistance. Technically speaking, it is identical to the well known 5015 50 Fathoms, but you can see it's got a more vintage inspired case, sheer sided, squared off lugs, minimal beveling, big crown, no guard profile, ceramic bezel insert. Super crisp, 120 click action. We'll do a loom shot here. Easy to see, with all three hands luminescent too, you know that it's ticking or not ticking in the dark, which is always important. I think every dive watch should have a loomed seconds hand, so you know if you're using it as a backup dive timer, whether it's functioning. The movement is the 1315 DD for day date, and it's as beautiful as the standard caliber. First, it fits a big case back nicely, a modern movement for big watches. Second, I love the rotor, which you can see has snailing on its outer rim, and then there's this sort of satin raised channel around its border, then there's the media blasted at center, and then mirror polishing on its edge. But you can see the beveling on the bridges is even more impressive. Huge bevels, deeply drawn and rounded and mirrored. We've got a free sprung balance at four hertz, shock resistant with an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring, and then we've got this lovely sort of snailing across the bridges rather than Cote de Genève. It's adjusted in six positions. It is a very precise movement. It is also a very fine movement. And the bath scaff is generally more wearable than the 5015. So you can see on my wrist, at just under 50 millimeters from lug to lug, I'm having no problem wearing this. You can wear this on a 16 centimeter circumference wrist or larger. And this is a true luxury diver. Sailcloth strap, rubber on the bottom. These straps last for a decade, sometimes more. They are incredibly strong. All of that with a steel pin buckle for quick adjustments on the fly. Debatune is the house brand here at the 1916 company. We've owned them since 1921. But I'm on record since 2016 saying this is my favorite brand, and maybe you can see why. These watches are spectacular. Sold in 2010, this is basically a piece unique created for the founder of Chrono Passion, Laurent Picciotto. You can actually see him riding a rocket through space with his initials, and then the star scatter pattern here is the sky over Laurent's hometown on the night he was born. These star patterns are not random. They are true reproductions of the star patterns in the sky over a particular place on a particular night. And that's what you're looking at here. The full globe, and that is what we're getting with this moon face, it is a sphere. It is one half blued steel, one half white palladium. It need not be adjusted for 122 years in between settings. You can see that the case, 44 millimeters in white gold, has a pusher adjuster for the moon phase. You can better see the three-dimensional qualities of that moon phase display, and also that the dial includes a toroidal outer track with polished cabochon of titanium that act as the hour indices. Now, the whole dial is fired and black polished, that is mirror-finished titanium, but what sets this apart from other Debatune watches is that it's a very early version of their fired titanium dial. It's super light, it's almost pale, and so when you compare it to something a little bit more recent, you can see how dark the titanium polish and firing has become. This titanium is fired for a longer period of time to make it darker, whereas this is almost pale by comparison. Collectors asked after the first 24 months or so that the dials be darker. So not only is this a piece unique, but it is a very rare dial variant to begin with. Now on the reverse side, you can see one of the reasons I love Debatune so much, zero compromise and audacity. This movement has enormous black polished steel barrel bridge caps and base plate caps. We have micro beveling on the ratchet wheel. You can see that on the edge of the teeth above the barrel. The barrel below that is snailed. You can see that the beveling is literally one mile wide. And there's two different beveled surfaces as we have the cap on the barrel bridge. Each one features ungulage on its edge. Look at the beveling in the jewel sinks. Look at the black polish of the balance bridge. And also look at the fact that we have Cote de Genève underneath that upper bridge. Even just this little bit that sticks out has been finished for your viewing pleasure. Six days of power reserve, self-adjusting barrel. It cannot accidentally be overwound, and that's patented. We have one, two, three shock protection springs. That's patented. It's called triple parachute. It makes the balance staff almost indestructible, and it actually improves timekeeping and chronometry. You can see the use of a silicon escape wheel to reduce friction and the need for lubrication, and the company's 2010 patent balance. The company has 
over 10 balance wheels now. Denis Flageolet, the watchmaking founder of the company, is never satisfied. Here he has a, a disc of silicon and then the majority of the mass in the rim, which is made of white gold. It's also resistant to temperature-induced timing deviation. Even the hairspring, which is shaped by hand, has a patented curve that breathes like an overcoil, but with the shock resistance and flat profile of a flat hairspring. There's a little subtle power reserve indicator at the bottom. And you can see this is the DB25 Moon Phase Starry Sky Piece Unique. A lot of folks say, I want a Dibitoon, I don't want something weird. The DB25 is for you. Conventional lugs, round case, solid dial. All three, including the movement, movement case and dial, made in-house at Dibitoon. And production was exceptionally low back in 2010 when this one was made. It's still just a few hundred pieces a year today. A lovely watch, and you can see all those little stars on the dial, solid blocks of white gold. And now for something completely different. In fact, so different, I can't honestly say I've ever seen another one. This is the Graf Star Randdat. The Graf Watch Company, or Graf Luxury Watches, established in 2008 as a vehicle for Graf Diamonds and Jewelers to get into the then burgeoning men's mechanical luxury watch market. Graf was well known for jewelry and for gems, but to the extent they made watches, generally quartz pieces made by others, Graf branded and for women. Graf luxury watches, on the other hand, was targeted towards men. They launched the Star Grand Dot in 2011, and this, in blue ceramic and rose gold, was a 50-piece limited edition. Now, you can see the gem references are everywhere. You can see that the crown itself is faceted, and then it contains an enormous cut diamond. The ceramic case features gem-like faceting. So does the dodecagonal, or dodecagonal bezel, which has 12 facets. And then you can see this twinkle pattern that's become the base of the dial in matte blue. You can also see a set triangular emerald. We have a power reserve indicator for the 50-hour power reserve, small seconds, fluted rose gold Dauphine-style hands. Note that there's sort of a wedge profile to the indices in rose gold. They're anything but generic. In fact, not Nothing about this watch is generic. It's only, despite being 45 millimeters in diameter, it's only 11.1 millimeters thick and 50.7 millimeters from lug tip to lug tip, so it really wears quite easily. Easy watch to wear on the wrist. Not that broad. Not that thick. And then you take a look at the reverse, and okay, interesting movement concept aesthetically, but turn it on its side, and this has a case back crystal like nothing you've ever seen before. It is peaked, it is faceted, and it has a million slight inflections that create a spectacular crystalline scatter pattern. How cool is that? You see the shape of the cut gem echoed in the skeletonization of the ratchet wheel over the barrel, as well as this sort of matrix that sits over the three-quarter plate. You can also see that the rustication or the texturing of the three-quarter plate is irregular and that the lines are actually not straight, almost like jagged pieces of natural crystal. We've got this cool custom combination click and click spring, and then we've got a black polished micrometric adjustment system with an eccentric screw and a high grade balance. You could see it's a splayed spoke balance, which means it was either a chronometer or top grade. Let me just pull the crown out so you can see. Splayed spoke with a hairspring of quality to match. That's only used on top grade and chronometer grade movements. Now at first I thought, okay, 6497, but then I noticed two things that didn't sit right. First, it's visibly smaller than a 6497, and I measured it. It's only about 30 millimeters. Then the train is different. A 6497 has a center wheel architecture, and if you have to re-engineer the train of a movement, there's no point in using the movement as a base for your caliber. That's where watchmaking gives way to engineering, and it costs a fortune to start moving trains around. So this is off-centered. What is this? It's a Zenith-style train. I also note that the crown release is a push button rather than the screw you find on a 6497, and then and it struck me, this is a 7750 without the chronograph and 
without the winding system. That's what we're looking at right here. The beat rate's wrong, the train's wrong, the details are wrong, the location of the case clamp screw, the diameter, that's what it is. It is a 7750 time only. It's like the Hobbering A11, which is almost exactly the same thing, but with different bridge designs. Now, Graf was open about not making this themselves, but getting it from a supplier. What you can see is that almost every single piece was custom made. There's little, if any, of the 7750 base still intact, and it is beautiful to look at. Taking a look at the clasp, it's one of the most elaborate I've ever seen. First, it's nicely made. Polished, media blasted, and then fitted with blue inlays. We have that triangular faceted gem motif again. The inlays are even present in profile on both sides. And then we've got a twin trigger release, and we've got this micrometric system that allows you to fine tune the fit when it's on the wrist using a detent mechanism and trigger releases. And then you can see that there's a little pin that will actually catch the straps. The strap goes through here, and then all the excess strap length hides underneath the strap so you don't see it and you don't need minder loops. Graf is no longer making watches like this, but it's very much still around, gainfully employed, making jewelry and cutting gems. So you can absolutely still have this serviced. It comes with full box and papers as well as a secondary rubber strap. So you're getting the full 2011 Graf experience. This one is retailed in 2012. I've never seen anything like it. It's a lot of fun to play with. It does have hacking seconds, a super fast index and quick set date, and when features as small as those wedge shaped indices are distinct, you know that a ton of thought went into this machine. Absolutely cool and my kind of watch. Definitely off the map and off the radar. Two very different watches from F.P. Journe. So let's start with the more common of the two. Actually, I'm going to take that back. I'm not totally sure that this 42 millimeter Boutique edition Octa Divine is scarcer than the 99 piece edition you're about to see. But I will say this it's unusual. Octa Divine has been made from sizes 36 millimeters up to 42, meaning it's had the largest range of case sizes of any Journe model. Here we have the larger case size in the modern era, 42. It is the Boutique edition, a series launched in 2009 that includes a combination of a black dial and a rose gold case. Needless to explain, boutique only. We have a polished bezel, sort of like a football or a kidney in board. That is black polished steel. We have this unique scrolling seconds display that I really like, and it's one of the center hand jorns, which makes it easier to read. We also have the moon phase display, a power reserve, all the printing here in a sort of gilded rose gold tone. We have two quick sets. We've got one that allows you to rapidly cycle the moon phase, and then another that allows you to rapidly cycle the flush fit discs of the double digit date. It's a big Big watch with a solid gold dial center that's been blackened, and then a solid gold movement and a solid gold case. It also has an option you rarely see on Jordan watches, a full deployant clasp in gold. Add up all these features, you wind up with a massive watch. The caliber, 18 karat rose gold bridges and plates, 22 karat rose gold engine turned rotor. Automatic winding, its chronometric power reserve is 120 hours, but as with all of the Octa 1300s, it will actually run for about 160 before it actually stops. Five position adjustment, free sprung, three hertz beat rate. Finish is getting better and better on Jordan watches, so you can see now the bevels look truly mirrored rather than their previous matte milled profile. And there's an attractive panoply of different engine turned sizes on the base plate with all screw heads black polished. I particularly like the juxtaposition of the guilloche grand Orge and the polishing on the rotor. Really nice piece, but it's got a lot of wrist presence, so be ready for that. Many people don't realize just how big the 42 millimeter Journes are. If you feel that the 40s and the 38s are too petite, this has got a lot of stance and presence. You can see it's almost eating up my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. It's not thick, but boy is it massive and broad. Now, in 2009, F.P. Journ was celebrating the fifth anniversary of his first factory store, the Tokyo Boutique. And in what was already by then a tradition, he launched a limited edition that combines super rare for F.P. Journ, grade five titanium and rose gold. So this is the Octa Contiem Perpetuel, so the Octa Perpetuel, uh, distinct from the later Octa Contiem. You, there is a later Octa Perpetual calendar that is very different. So this Octa Perpetual, as opposed to the 
version that came in 2013. This is based on the calendrier. So this is the Octa Perpetual Tokyo Anniversary 99-piece limited edition. We have a dial of gold, but it's been coated with ruthenium to darken it. We have a retrograde date display. We have a window-style day and then a window-style month. And the way he turned this into a perpetual calendar was he added a leap year function to the annual calendar. He also wanted the watch to be set entirely using what was already present on the case. He didn't want you to need a tool because he knows people will lose the tool and then try to set the watch with a pen and wind up damaging it. So the crown sets most of the calendar functions, but then there's a little system on the side. He wanted you to be able to set the calendar without a tool, but also do it without accidentally resetting it. So you pull this little slide on the Octa Perpetuel, and then you adjust the month. And so every time February pops up, it will show you using a window within a window where you are in the leap year cycle. Now you can see it's three. And when you get to the fourth year of the cycle, the leap year, February pops up and you have a B for B sextile or leap en Francais. Now, more details that set this apart. You could see that the dial side assembly screws here are brushed rose gold rather than the conventional that you'll see on Jorn, which is generally polished steel. See how these are polished steel? These are gold, but there's more. If you look at the bezel for the subdial, you can see it's been brushed on its top and then mirror beveled on its side. On the reverse, you could see that the Octa Perpetuel features a rose gold caliber 1300. Once again, as with the Divine, five days chronometric power reserve, but it will run for 160. Rose gold, here you see the movement's probably a better fit for the case size. This is a 40 than it is for the 42, but you wear it like this. Jorn's first perpetual calendar and a real milestone before the later larger Cantium Perpetuel, which was a bit more controversial in its aesthetic. This does feature a rose gold pin buckle, and it's an easy watch to wear. It's not too light because it does have the rose gold movement and the solid gold dial. So if you think that a luxury watch should have a little bit of weight to it, you're going to like this. You're really going to enjoy it. It's going to be a great companion and super rare. Jean's not making any more of these, and it was a really important milestone in his development as a watchmaker. Okay, so I've got a watch from a group brand that to me has always felt like an independent, and that is Alanga Unzona. So with Alanga, we got a 1815 flyback chronograph in 2004. It was made through 2008 in its first generation. A new one came out in 2010, but a lot of folks love the original for a couple of reasons, dealing with the shape of the hands, the texture, tone, depth, and scales of the dial. So this right here is very easy to wear, smaller than the datagraph, considerably smaller, at about 39.5 millimeters, it's much thinner because it doesn't have the datagraph's date or with the datagraph up down, date and power reserve mechanism. So you see it's thinner, but on the back, it's identical to a datagraph because all of the datagraph's complications are on the dial side. So here we have a manual wind, 2.5 hertz, column wheel lateral clutch chronograph, with an overcoil hairspring, a five position adjustment, bridges and plates of German silver, which is a nickel copper zinc alloy. The copper gives it that golden hue. And you can see all of these silver parts are steel chronograph components. Look at the screws. We have both fired blue screws and polished screws. And there is a difference here. For the most part, the polished screws relate to the tuning and adjustment of the mechanism, whereas the blued screws fix things that are not supposed to move into place. Now, if you look at the clutch, it's this structure next to the column wheel that moves in and out from the center. You can see that there are sharp inward bevels as well as outward points where bevels converge in either a sharp crease or a sharp point. That is very difficult to do. You could see that the steel parts of the chronograph are satinated on their tops and mirror beveled on their sides, and that the bridges feature streifen or stripes on the top and beveling on their edges. And the feel of that column wheel is best in the business. It's got rivals, there's no doubt, but I would say it's co-equally best with a short list of competitors. And then we have freehand engraving on the balance cock with black polishing and micro beveling on the swan's neck fine adjustment index. Swan's neck fine adjustment index, by the way, let me show you that just one more time. We'll get a little bit closer. 
The watch does feature a stop seconds function. You can see that the hairspring is an overcoil, a rare feature on Longus. And then looking at that swan's neck index, you can see that it's been bladed on its end, beveled on its side, and then fully specular finished or black polished on its top. It turns black as you angle it through the light. It's only visible bright at the one angle at which it reflects light. That's what black polish is. And again, much easier to wear than a dotograph. Much flatter, more compact, competitive with something like a Vacheron Corn de Vache chronograph. Classically beautiful. The dial is made of sterling silver, but it's galvanized black. So it's actually a precious metal dial. It is a flyback chrono, so reset and restart without first stopping. And then the fun thing here, I probably need to wind it a little bit more, uh, is that it also has a pulsation scale. So you can see that we have 30 pulsations, a feature lost on the second generation watch. This is one of the things people missed. You can also see how it has a two level dial with the scale actually overhanging the center. Really cool stuff. Beautiful Arabic numerals. That's what makes it an 1815. In 2018, late 2018, for the 2019 model year, the Grunefelds, Tim and Bart of the Netherlands, launched their first automatic with some help from a friend. More on that in a moment. But the 1941 Principia was the result, and this is the connoisseur's preference among Principia production. There's several different dials, straps, and case metals, but the steel 39.5 millimeter case with the Dutch orange granular dial seems to be the favorite. Now you see fired blue alpha hands, micro faceted and mirror polished applique indices, a granular profile reminding you that the watch is made in Oldenzaal in the Netherlands. Now the Grunefelds have closed their order book and they periodically reclose it after reopening it. But we have good inventory, so you actually have a choice of Principia's here. The case is beautiful. Not only compact, being under 47 millimeters lug to lug and thin at just over 10 millimeters thick, but you can see the fluting and scalloping of the lugs is sensational. There's a concave profile to the bezel and it actually flares at 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock. We've got a buffalo leather strap with a wonderful contrasting cyan stitch, and then the Dutch orange on the bottom. Now, buffalo, true, not commonly seen. What does it feel like? Really soft. On the back, the movement, the six by the Grunefelds, this is where they got some help from their friend. This is actually an Andreas Streller construction. You'll see it, for example, on the new Streller Cerna, but the bridges, plates, all of the primary components are Grunefeld. They're just looking for uh, Streller's winding system and train from the barrel down to the escapement. So the bridges are made of stainless steel. You can see they're recessed and media blasted internally with a satin channel around their edge and then mirror beveled on their ends. They have the shape of the bell gable roofs of traditional Dutch houses. We have golden chaton cups for the jewels, a pocket watch nod, solarization of the barrel cap. The bridges are all stainless steel because it's super hard to finish. And you can see six position adjustment, one more than a standard chronometer. Four separate finishes on the rotor, solarization of the ball bearing at center, skeletonization of the train wheels. You can see we have a skeletonized full balance bridge with a free sprung balance beaten away with three hertz. And it's got a 56 hour power reserve. Cost, no object, a 22 carat winding mass, not 21, not 18, not rose gold plated tungsten. Everything about this movement is surpassing in its beauty and sophistication. Also an easy watch to wear, super easy to wear. As you can see, fitting underneath the cuff, narrow across the wrist, it's beautifully proportioned to wear on a wrist as small as 14 centimeters circumference, maybe even 13 and a half. I definitely recommend this for him and for her. Finally, a watch whose movement is so spectacular, I actually opened up the bracelet, something I never do for these videos. From Parmigiani Fleurier, a 2023 uncatalogued, unadvertised, limited edition of five pieces. It's the Tonda PF split seconds chronograph. The dial, although salmon colored, is actually media blasted platinum. The hands, indices, and date frame are white gold. We have a split seconds trigger, coaxial with the crown, a biplanar fluted bezel, the Tonda case shape with its lovely stepped and tapered lugs, full integrated matching platinum bracelet, 
I was able to get the approximate mass yesterday of 300 grams, basically three quarters of a pound. It's got all the things you expect. It's got stop seconds. It's got a quick set date. It's got column wheels and a vertical clutch. In fact, the column wheels are exposed under bridges of solid gold, like FP Journe, 18 karat bridges and plates. Unlike FP Journe, finished to make your eyes water. The bevels are a mile wide. Look at the quality and depth of those interior angles. They've been drawn out almost onto the tops of the bridges. You could see those two column wheels in action. The watch featuring sensational column wheel feel, vertical clutch smoothness, manual wind, 65 hours of power reserve, and an El Primero-like beat rate of 36 thousand vibrations per hour free sprung with a full balance bridge for shock resistance this is the movement from the legendary 2016 tonda chronor anniversaire you can even see the shape of the tonda lugs cut onto the barrel itself and actually as the barrel rotates michel parmigiani's signature will roll by the feeling of these column wheels is equal to the longa you just saw look at these interior angles how many well i gave up counting as i was approaching 50 there are Geneva seal movements that don't have one. You will never see this again or have this opportunity again. One of five, and it was never on the website and never in the catalog. Beyond belief, Grubel Forcey, eat your heart out. Parmigiani Fleurier, riding high with the success of the Tonda PF Sports Watch series, and you better believe this is a sports watch 100 meters water resistant on top of everything else. So, this watch. I would say one of the most impressive independent watchmaking products because Parmigiani, through its affiliate companies, the companies it owns, it's like a little cottage industry that adds up to an integrated manufacturer. Cadrons et habillage for dial parts and hands. We have Les Artisans Boitiers for cases, bracelets, and clasps. Vauche, manufacturer for movements. Parmigiani for overall design. Eta Calpa for wheels and small movement parts everything made within the Parmigiani companies with beautiful finish and silky wrist feel. It is overwhelming in its beauty. 42 millimeters in diameter, but it wears well on my wrist. You can see this watch here. It's going to get away from me a little bit. That's what happens when you open up a bracelet. But this watch fits beautifully with the lugs contouring perfectly to my wrist. 15 centimeter circumference wrists and up, ready to go. Just get yourself on a weight program because this thing is physically massive. You can see the bracelet internally with plenty of gaps to avoid pinching skin or pulling hair. Super refined. They thought of everything. It has the Parmigiani maker's mark. And then we have a double deployment clasp with Parmigiani logo externally. You can see condition is immaculate. You are going to enjoy the watch to the same degree as the original owner. Look at these teardrop Tonda style lug profile pushers. This watch is the best of everything. It is the bee's knees. Again, Grubel Forsey, Ferdinand Bertou, even Long und Heine. Watch out. Parmigiani's got your number. Reach out to Team Also at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details.